So good evening. We're back for our last lecture on this initiative and diffs destination Brazil. And today we're going to talk about dewatering. So so far we all know that water is, is paramount important for us in mineral processing. Definitely we can do a lot without water, but when water comes in into mineral processing plant, then we can tackle fine particles. And it's quite difficult, or in some cases merely impossible to do this without water. So after using this water, we can just throw it away. Okay, if we try to do this, the amount of water that we're going to require to just run our mineral processing plant, it's going to be unfeasible and definitely would have to rethink all the process. Okay, just for you to have a glimpse of the idea, normally the solids content in the froth flotation would be around 35%. Definitely we can reach 50%, but not more than that. So if we consider like 30%, we talk about something roughly like 130 solids and 230 water. Okay, so we're going to have in our system definitely more water than we have solids. So we have to give a destination to this water. And normally the destination is bring back the water into the mineral processing plant. And that's what we call recirculation of the water. So in this lecture, we're going to take a little consideration about the water and the impact of the water in the mineral processing plant. But we're just going to be scratching the surface of it. OK, it's not enough. It's definitely not enough to have two or three hours to talk about water and the importance of water to us. But I'm going to try to give you some feedback regarding this. OK, so in the beginning and by beginning, I mean 20 years ago, 30 years ago of this century, water was not something so important that is like today. Uh, today, water reached another level. Why? First, because we're having shortage of water in the whole Brazil. Second, because the population is increasing and, of course, we're demanding more water. And on top of that, mineral processing is still requiring more water. Okay, So in some cases, I can just perform flotation with any kind of water. I need new water. I need to dilute my minerals with water, chemically speaking, that is going to fit my demands. Okay, so it's not only the thing about B water. It has to be a water that chemically it's suitable for flotation. So after that, what are we going to do? We're going to, to reuse this water. Okay. So unfortunately, it's not very common for us, even nowadays, if we just use water in the mineral processing plant and then have a water treatment facility and take back this water. Normally, what we do is we use the water and then, or we throw back this water into nature, or we use the water as it is in the mineral processing plant again. Okay? And to avoid problems like getting more electrolytes in the water, we just dilute this recirculated water with new water. Okay, So in the end, that's going to be how we're going to proceed in order to prepare water for our flotation. Some countries, they are doing this slightly different. For example, Chile, they're performing flotation nowadays with seawater. So they can take the seawater, pass through some process, if that's the case, in order to prepare the water and then feed the mineral processing plant normally in the milling stage with this seawater and they can perform flotation with this water. And on top of that, and to make things even more beautiful, they developed some roots, flotation roots. They can just prepare the material and float this material with the seawater as it is, okay, without any other preparation. Unfortunately, we can't do this yet from Brazil. We don't have this kind of technology regarding the chemicals. We even try to do some research regarding calcium, mang manganese, and phosphorus in the water. And one thing that is for sure is if you have a high electrolyte load in your water, then you're going to spoil your flotation. So definitely, or we need new water, or we need to process this water in a pro small process plant. 
or a treatment plant for this water in order to take this water back into flotation. So yes, we have many challenges ahead of us. That's why this lecture is called challenge, but water is one of those. I'm not going to say it's the mainly problem that we have, okay, or the higher pro uh, problem that we have so far, but definitely in one of those. I think it would be like top five problems that we have now to tackle. And among those, fine particles, low grade, but definitely water. Water supply, water quality, everything regarding water. Okay, and if you consider that we're going to move into dry process for some wars, this is actually true. We can do this, but not for all material that we have on our hands. So we're still going to have this necessity to use water in our mineral processing plant. It's going to be quite difficult just to move away from water into another fluid, for example, air. So we can actually use three different kinds of process regarding dewatering. The first one is going to be sedimentation. And this sedimentation could be only gravity, but we can also use the centrifugal force. That's why we have the centrifugal sedimentation. We can do filtration. And last but not least, we can do thermal drying. And we're going to avoid at all costs thermal drying. Why? Because of the costs, because of losing water in the process. So again, if it's possible, we're going to stay with just the two first stages. If that's not possible, then we're going to move into the third one. OK, but let's take a look first on the other two. So this is quite normal to take a look at this. OK, and this is what? This is a small flow sheet that's going just to show us the thickness and after the thickener, we have a vertical press filter, and then we have our copper concentrate. On the other hand, we're going to have zinc and lead concentrate too. And as you can see, we have two, in this case, three dewatering uh, stages. The first one is going to be a thickener. After that, we're going to have another filter, and this is a vacuum filter. In this case, it's a disk vacuum filter. And after that, we have a dryer. Okay, and that's why that's the kind of dryer that I was mentioned to you before that we have to avoid at all costs. But nevertheless, we have this thermal dryer in the end of the process. But as you can see over here, I'm only showing you concentrates. Okay, and in the beginning, again, it was quite common to have this. So I have many concentration stages, and after that, I'm going to dry my concentrate. Why? First, because my client doesn't want to buy water. Second, because I'm going to save a lot of money in transportation, because if I try to transport water, I'm going to have to pay the price, and it's only water. And secondly, oh, sorry, and lastly, because the process, the downstream process, probably is not going to require so much water. Okay, maybe if I'm do be doing something connected with the hydrometallurgy, I can use this water. But normally, that's not the case, especially if I'm going into pyrometallurgy or even into agglomeration. Okay, That's something quite important for us. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time enough to have another chapter. But if we could have another lecture, definitely it's going to be agglomeration. Okay, Quite important to mineral processing, especially in the moment that we're living, that we're doing fine particles all the time. Okay, But nowadays, especially in Brazil, we actually looking more about the watering of the tailings than we're only looking as the as we used to do before to the concentrates because we know how to do this with concentrates okay concentrate it's okay it's part of the process yeah i'm gonna have to pay extra money to remove the water but again it is what it is it is the process i have to concentrate and after that i have to remove water but how about the tailings? The problem of the tailings is tailing dams. We had two major failures of tailing dams in Brazil, and they are quite close to each other. So we try to avoid tailing dams in Brazil nowadays. And if it's possible, we would try to make dry stacking of our tailings instead of just throw it on the tailing dams. Okay, it's safer. And even more pleasable, we're going to use less area by doing the dry stack that we're actually going to require for the tailing dams. 
So if you consider this, we're going to have a lot of more advantages if we do this dry stacking. On the other hand, it's going to be more expensive. Okay, so there is nothing perfect in the world, at least nothing perfect in our mineral processing world. In this case, we're going to have to pay extra money. But some authors, they are pointing out nowadays that probably dry stacking in the long term is going to pay itself. Okay, we have to wait and see what's going to happen in the next few years. But definitely, uh, I'm very fond to see what's going to happen. Okay, because again, as I mentioned to you before, this reservoir, the staling dams, we're going to reclaim it in the future. That's the main idea. We're going to come back to that and we're going to exploit it. And we, in the end, we're going to feed our mineral processing plant with this material. If we move into dry stacking, it's going to be even more simple to us just to reclaim the material. Okay, I don't have a lot of water on top of this new material, so it's going to be more accessible to me. So again, we have to wait and see what's going to happen with us in Brazil and with the world in the next couple of years. So let's talk about sedimentation, okay? So when we talk about sedimentation, what comes in our hand is thickness. Normally, it's the first thing that comes into our hand, to our mind would be thickness. Why? Because thickness are all about sedimentation, okay? But to talk a little bit about sedimentation itself, in this case, I'm thinking about having water and solids, which means a slurry or a pulp, and I'm going to just to let the material stand over there and after a few minutes or even hours in some case days the solids start to move downwards and it's going to precipitate in the bottom of my container okay so that phenomenon we're going to call this sedimentation definitely we need to do something about kinetics of the process we need to enhance this kinetics and i'm going to show you why and how how to do this Nevertheless, we can even use different forces in order to make the sedimentation a little bit faster. Okay. And one thing that we have to get used to is to take a look at this kind of picture and understand what we're seeing over there. Okay. So, as you can see, we have something similar to a swimming pool. You can see that all the equipment are inside the earth, it's down below. Okay. And we have to excavate this and then we start to build up from the hole up and then we can eventually have some structure like this this is also possible but we're going to show you also different alternatives for this for example we're going to have thickness completely above the ground okay so this is underground and we're going to have thickness above the ground again there are pros and cons of both i'm going to try to show you a little bit okay of this two options so when we talk about sedimentation, we can directly correlate this with lab tests. And it's quite good if you can perform some lab tests first before you try to go to your mineral processing plant, because you need to make a correct design of your thickener or if you're a filter and so on. And the lab can help you a lot with this. Okay. So the basic test that everyone has to do is the cylinder test okay so this cylinder test is what i'm just gonna take this graduated cylinder it's a glassware it's standard for all kind of labs and normally we use two liters graduated cylinder okay so we're gonna take this material this this glassware we're gonna put our poop inside of it we start some kind of agitation it's quite important that all solids are on the liquid phase on the beginning of the test and then I'm going straight to my chronometer and I'm just going to wait and see what's going to happen. In the beginning, I'm going to see something like this. I just have this B face along all, sorry, where is my pen? Right here, along all my cylinder. Okay. And then I'm going to measure this height of the cylinder. It's called it age. And as time goes by, we're going to start to see some interfaces. Okay, so I have this interface over here. That's an interface between zone A and zone B. What is zone A? Clear liquid. Okay, so when I say clear, I mean it. It's clear liquid. So you can see through it. And if you put your hand behind it, you can see it quite perfectly. Okay, so we have this clear liquid. We still have the zone B. 
okay? But we can see a D and a C zone forming, and the D zone is going to be the settled bed. So my solids are going down, and they are settling in the base of my cylinder. And I can see that it's something different is happening over there, okay? The solid is starting to piling up over there. And on this C zone over here, I have a variable concentration. So if I take a look on the height, I'm going to see something like the density of the poop varying in this zone. Okay, so four different zones could occur inside of my cylinder. That's not a prerequisite. Okay, sometimes you can have just two interfaces, sometimes just three interfaces. So that doesn't go, that's not the same for all minerals. Okay, and it's even quite common just to have two interfaces, okay? And I'm not talking about also gas liquid interface. That's going to be always there, okay? So let's just neglect this. I'm not going to talk about this interface over here, glass liquid, okay? Sorry, air liquid. We don't want to take a look, uh, a look at that. And again, as time goes by, what we're going to see is the ending of the zone B and eventually the end of zone C, and I'm gonna have just zone A and zone D. In this case, as you can see, zone D just increase with the changing of time. That's also not something that's going to happen with all minerals, okay? Some cases in the end of the process, I can have a zone D with a height smaller than, for example, in T2 or T3. Why? What's going to happen that's going to have this shrink of zone D, for example, the interface is going to be this and not this anymore, not this interface, but something around here. Because as you're going to pile up the solids, you're going to have the stress increasing. And then we're going to have something like this. The solid is going to start to compress the settled bed and the water that still remains inside of the settled bed is start to go out of it and then you have a decrease in the volume of the zone d okay and on the other hand you can think like this as being uh increasing the density of zone d okay both are correct and that's actually happens a lot okay and it's quite important for us to remember this okay if i don't do anything my solids is going to become then my pulp is going to become denser because my solid is going to be more close together. And if you, for example, put this material in a bucket and just lay the bucket around for a few days, when you start to drain the water just by pouring it, the water out of the bucket, you're going to see that all of your solids are going to be quite rigid in the end of the bucket. Sometimes you have to take a spoon or something and just dig the solid out of your other bucket, okay? And that takes a long time. So again, but now with just color picture, we have the clarified zone, the discrete zone, the settling zone, transition zone, and the compression zone. And in the end, settled bed. As I mentioned to you before, everything in here is going to be directly connected with time. So if I take a graphic of the height of these zones, time, what I'm going to see is the go down, 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 until it a certain point. And after that, it's going to be like a constant, a flat line, a horizontal line, okay? But then again, I can even change the orientation of this X, or this Y axis. And then we can even have something different, like an increase on, the, uh, on Y axis, and then I reach something like a flat line, okay? So one case or the other, they're both correct. Normally, we prefer to use this kind of graph as I'm showing you right here, okay? And I was impressed when I, I, I saw this paper, okay, and it's a very good paper. And what the authors did was something like this. They start to take pictures at a, a regular time frame and then just pile up, they just compile the pictures and they plot the pictures behind the graphic. And as you can see over here, definitely we have an interface at the beginning right here. And as I mentioned to you, we can have more than wow. one interface, but I, I just can't see another interface in here. That's quite normal for us to see an interface in here, a very, very clear interface. But in this case, 
just didn't happen. Okay, so yeah, move forward and let's do with this. And this is zone A. Okay, definitely that's zone A. So that's where we have our clarified liquid. And again, as you can see over here, the quality of this clarified liquid is quite good. Okay, it's quite reasonable. So if you want to take more uh, information or take a serious look about this, just go on my YouTube channel. I posted a video over there that I perform a completely test regarding this using some flocculants. And you can see a test that we fail in, in, in order to reach a very good sedimentation. And then we have a last test that we can could actually have the material dewatered. Okay, so take a look at this video. I'm going to post down here the link for this video. I think you're going to like it a lot. Okay, it's quite good. And we're preparing now a completely test regarding this cylindrical graduated tube. Okay, and then we're going to be able to do it all and even to plot this graphic if you want. Okay, but when we take a look at the graphic, we can also see on the graphic that it's zone A, zone B, C, and D. Okay, and then we have some very important points when we have, for example, chains, major chains happening inside of our process. And that's the case of the critical sedimentation point. Okay, so when we reach this critical sedimentation point, we can see that we change the inclination of the curve and then we start to stabilize this curve. Okay, so this point is also paramount importance when we have to do the designing of a thickener or the design of for other equipments to do this kind of separation, this kind of dewatering. So yes, go for this graphic. It is very important. And I brought some extra information regarding this. And the first one that we have to consider is pH. Okay. So when we talk about pulp and slurry, pH is really important. We always have to remember this. Why? Because the particle surface is going to be charged okay we're gonna have a superficial charge in our particles so in here i have to make this question to myself what i want to do with my particles because if i want to perform flotation probably i'm going to be in one range of ph if i don't want to do flotation if i want to do for example the watering then it's going to be the opposite because if you take a look at flotation, I don't want to have particles getting attached to each other. I want a particle get attached to the air bubble, if that's the case, okay? If that is my concentrate and I need to float it, okay? But on the other hand, if I don't want to have particles getting stuck to each other, what's going to happen with them? And eventually, those fine particles can just stay in my solution, stay on the bulk of the solution. And as much as time passes by, this solid percentage, this solid content is going to be increasing and increasing and increasing. And at certain point, that's going to be a problem for me. Okay. And then you can see these two pictures over here. Actually, we have four pictures, but we can divide on picture on your left and on your right hand side. And when you take a look at the right hand side, let's start with the right hand side first we can see some calciums. So calcium atoms represented in this case by spheres, but some, some calcium spheres. And when I take a look at the left hand side, I just can't see it, okay? So the left hand side would be something like a slurry without any kind of additions, okay? I don't have anything like that. I just have my slurry and we don't have a proper pH control of it, okay? So when you take a look at this, I can see that the particle surface in this case is going to be all negative. And this is also quite common if you're in the alkaline range of the pH spectrum. Okay, probably that's what you're going to see. You're going to see something like this, particles charged negatively. Okay, and then we have a layer. And I know that's quite strange and looks like sci-fi, but it is not. Okay, definitely that's not sci-fiction. What's going to happen is if my mineral surface has some kind of load, some kind of charge, this particle is going to attract, because there are interactions, it's going to attract some electrolytes near it. Okay, just consider this. Imagine that we have a plate here in our hand without water, 
and I just start to pass an electric current to this plate and I'm going to generate an electrostatic field. Okay, so if you take a look at any kind of electrostatic filters in your home, just like your TVs, you're going to see that you're going to have a lot of dust on it. Okay, why? Because dust is going to be attracted, immediately attracted to this kind of setup. Okay, to this kind of uh, computer screens, TV screens, and so on. Okay, so if you have this electric charge, passing through this plate and generating an electromagnetic field, definitely particles, fine particles in Brownian's uh, movement, they're going to drive into this part. They're going to derive and they're going to move into these areas. Okay, so that's what we see or we can see on our left-hand side, okay, on the, on the upper part. If you take a look at the bottle, bottle okay, what you're going to see is the electrical potential versus the distance from the surface so as you can imagine if i move away from the surface of my particle then the electrical interactions is going to be almost tending to zero that's going to be reduced and then it's going to stabilize but that probably reach some zero if you're very far away okay and if the electrostatic potential it's also small because you don't have something like electric affinities between the two phases okay so by doing this, we can actually define something like bound layer, diffuse layer, and bulk solution. Solution. What is the bulk solution? Is that part of the solution that actually doesn't care if there is a mineral particle around or not? Okay, it just doesn't feel the presence of this particle. If you go to the diffuse layer, definitely we know that something strange is happening. It's, we can have an analogy, okay, and roughly. We can imagine something like this, okay? If I'm away from the red dot zone over here, call it the bulk solution. Okay, so if I'm inside the bulk solution, I'm not going to be pulled by the gravity field of the particle, okay? So the gravity produced by the particle has no interaction with me. I know this is quite wrong to say, okay? But just going to move from the concept of the electrostatic field into the gravity field okay so let's consider just this translation and i know that's not physically correct but let's keep like this okay so if on the other hand i get in and even more close to the, my mineral particle what i'm gonna see is i'm gonna start to feel the presence of this particle in the form of an electrostatic field okay and some things can happen so for flotation i don't want to have particles stuck it together okay i don't want to have particles closed related to each other so when i'm performing flotation what i want is a dispersion of material okay that's incredible for me it's going to be very good flotation if i reach something like that but on the other hand i'm not just going to put some chemicals on my froth flotation because i can spoil the flotation by doing this so i'm just going to pray that my material doesn't come on each other and start to agglomerate okay if this is going to start to happen then probably you're going to have to change your ph okay and then you can try to solve the problem but if i go now to the right hand side what you're going to see is i added calcium to the solution and this calcium two plus is going to have a different situation regarding this calcium so i'm going to have something like a synergy between the calcium particles and the other particles present in my slurry. And then I can have or an aggregation of the particles or a complete dispersion of the particle. That's why you have to understand from now on something like this. If you add too much flocculant or too much, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Oh my God, I'm really tired today. I'm skipping words now. So we're gonna have like a coagulant and flocculant, okay? So if I add too much coagulant or too much flocculant, instead of having this dispersion became something entirely new, entirely different, start to have the production of flux, okay? I'm gonna see exactly the opposite. Instead of having agglomeration, I'm gonna have dispersion. Okay, so flocculant in excess is going to be a 
a dispersant agent, okay? Just like uh, I showed you before. So this is actually a simplification of the model, okay? So if I have this electrical particles, the electrical charged particles, I can have a coagulation between two or more particles. On the other hand, if I start to with polymers and not with flow of coagulants anymore, I'm going to see things differently. For example, I'm going to see in one polymer chain more than one particle get attached to it. Okay, and then I have like a uh, a necklace where I have this line, and attached to the line I have many mineral particles on that. Okay, and polyacrylamide are great to do this. So if you want to choose a very good flocculant, just go to PAM, to PAN, and then after that, you're going to start to take a look at what kind of material is more suitable for your process, and definitely you can find something, okay? Polyacrylamide, they are quite important to us, and they are quite clever regions, okay, and quite malleable. You can change from one to another, and then you can enrich, enhance a lot your process, okay? So perform tests, go to the lab scale tests, and then draw a lot of conclusions out of that because it is important and it is feasible, okay? So remember this, it is feasible. So taking a look uh, about the mechanisms of coagulation and flocculation, okay? Let's start first with coagulation. And in here I present you two ways that we can perform coagulation. The first one is the center, which is charge neutralization, okay? And what's going to charge ne neutralization is my mineral particles are all negative, and then we have some ions, positive ions on solution, and this positive ions just go to migrate near my mineral particles, and after doing this, they start to bond with my mineral particles, and then what I'm going to see is, since everybody is, uh, is already bonded to each other, so the average uh, charge of my mineral surface tends to zero, and when this happens, we start to have uh, depression. We start to have this sedimentation of our material, okay? Because if I don't have this, if I can't break this potential, okay, what's going to happen is instead of having the dewatering, I'm going to still have solids in every place of my water, okay? So we have to do this rightfully, otherwise we're not going to do this at all. Okay, another thing that can happen is to call it uh, sweep coagulation. And what you can see over here is, again, we're going to have this charge, but instead of having all particles charged, I'm going to have some particles with charge zero and other particles remaining with their charge, their superficial charge. And what's going to happen is the particles that are going to get together, that are going to be even closer and closer and closer, and the pack it's increasing all the time, but we're going to see is the material actually start to behave as one, and then we have sedimentation. And these two cases are normally seen for coagulants, but when we move to flocculant, we have a brand new world, and the first one is breeding, and the second one is pet flocculation, okay? So this breeding is going to have how? We're going to have one single polymer with different particles on it. And if this can happen, then for sure, I'm gonna be able to have like one uh, mineral particle laying around. This mineral particle is going to get in touch with my polyacrylamide. And when this happens, we get together, we get close, in a close position to another particle, but this particle is already attached to other ones using the same principle. So instead of just connect with this last particle, I can do something strange and go into the middle and I connect with all the particles with that flock at the same time, okay? So this is actually can happen. And that's what you're seeing right here in this figure, okay? So as you can see in here and in here, they are completely different. This one, one polymer get in touch with one or more particles. In some case, we can have something like this, cross reference of the, the polymers. But if you talk about path flocculation, path flocculation, it's the opposite. We're going to have one flocculant, and this flocculant is going to absorb in the whole surface of the mineral. So instead of having space 
for more agglomeration, I'm just going to throw my flocculant and the flocculant is going to straight to the fine particles and then I can float, I can't do anything with that, okay? Why? Because I have just particles with zeta potential tending to zero, okay? So the superficial charge are going to be literally changing into zero and I don't want that, okay? So that's the four mechanisms that I want to show you guys and you can see one by one, side by side and with this you can spot the difference among them, okay? It's quite simple. So I think this slide can summarize everything that we know so far. At the beginning, I have this pulp, this slurry, and I'm not sure yet if my slurry is negative, if my slurry, slurry it's alkaline pH, I don't know. Okay, but then I'm going to introduce coagulants and I'm going to introduce flocculants. And I know that's not scientifically correct, but in Brazil, we do a lot of this. We formulate a hypothesis and then we just go straight to the lab. We don't perform, for example, validation and statistical assay. We just go straight to the mineral processing plant or if we're not so lucky, to the lab. Okay, and what I can see over here is something quite reasonable. There are this maximum in mineral processing plants that coagulant are not okay. They are actually really bad, okay? And what we want to do is flocculant. So sometimes people do this on purpose. So you have to, okay, I can't use coagulant. I like it, it's quite nice coagulant, but I'm not going to be using, okay? So that's, can actually happen, okay? And I'm not talking about someone trying to jeopardize your process or your test, that's not the case, okay? But the coagulant is just not working. Why? As you can see over here, we can have particles getting attached to each other, okay? That's happening. And in this case, it looks like a water molecule. It's not a water molecule, okay? But I'm, what I'm seeing over here is like three particles getting near to each other. But even so, they are not sedimentary. Okay, we don't have this sedimentation yet. Or if we have some sort of sedimentation, the dynamics are not okay. So the kinetic of the process is too low. When I go to flocculation, then we can have an increase on the, the, the kinetics of the system. So instantly decrease of the time that I need to wait in order to remove my water. Blocks are going to be more close together than what we're going to have with the coagulant. Okay, and I have some P to you. But as I mentioned to you before, when we talk about flocculants uh, in mineral processing plant, we always think about polyacrylamides. Okay, we those a lot. And as you can see over here, there's another picture from this graduated cylinder test. And in here we have three cylinders, and looks like they already finished their experiment, and that's okay, actually true. And the cylinder one, I think it's quite knitted. It's quite easy to see that the height of material cylinder one, it's smallest, it's below cylinder two and cylinder three. So something different happened between the first one, the second one, and the third one, okay? So what did happen? So could be something like a slightly change in the pH, true, okay? If I change the pH from test A for B and C, I'm gonna see something like this, but that wasn't the case for this example, okay? So what really happened in this example was, I changed the dosage of the flocculants from 100 milligram per liter to 300 and ultimately to 600 milligrams per liter, okay? And if you take a look at these three curves over here, of course, for 100 milligram per liter, per liter, I have something like this. So the sediment ratio, which is going to be this, if I go to 300 millimeters, I have a smallest increase in our curve. But if I reach 600 milligrams per liter, then I have something slightly different, okay? It's going to be good for us. But people, let's see something in here, okay? When we've made this change, we change, we change the dosage of my flocculant, okay? As much flocculant as I'm adding to the system, what is happening with the sediment volume, okay? So we talk about this amount of material in here. The sediment volume is going to be this amount of material, okay? 
So again, if I increase the dosage, I was thinking that I would have more particles going down, okay? And that's not happened. As you can see, that's not happened. So 600 milligrams per liter, it was our worst case, worst scenario at all. So you have to take a look at this and be extra careful with this kind of evaluation, okay? They are very important to us. We need to know this, but could be a little bit confusing. So this is another picture from the same paperwork, for the same paper. And as you can see on your left-hand side, they adjusted the, the pH of the solution. They start the, the process. And after something like five minutes, this cylinder glass A would be like the same thing that we would have, for example, in our mineral processing plant. But in this case, we had almost no sedimentation because we didn't add any chemicals to the cylinder A. Okay, so without chemicals in the cylinder A, what I'm going to have is very, very, very small kinetics of my process. Okay, so I'm going to have to wait like three, four, 15 days to see something. And nobody wants to do this, okay? Because it's just money thrown away. So then again, when we change from one cylinder to the other, what I'm seeing is on my left hand side, I have a cylinder with pH three. And the settling time was allowed five minutes. Okay, so even after five minutes, I can't see a solid interface. And one thing that I can see for sure is I have material in all of my cylinder. When I go to the middle one, okay, the cylinder in the middle of the other two, I have the same settling time, five minutes, but now the pH, the pH was just three, just three. So what it, we did was we made the measurements, we adjusted the pH, and then we made the matter the we perform the assay, we make the measurements again of my process. If I don't have any major change from one scenario to the other, I can conclude like the pH doesn't change my process, but normally it will change your process, okay, definitely. And what is the last cylinder on your right hand side? Here the guys made something quite clever, okay? They just let pH nine. So they have a duplicate for pH nine. But then the guys start to think something like this, okay? And for example, if this is something critical for me, I can't, for example, deliver this kind of water to the water supply chain in my city because I can eventually kill someone by drinking this water. So I have to be extra careful with that. If I have something like this, this kind of considerations, probably I'm going to try the middle cylinder if the cylinder from my right to my left because maybe if i try to make this this change in both at the same time i can have something like a clone or something even more subtle that's going to show me where i want to be okay where i want to reach and by changing these two together maybe i can have a third result and this third result would be better than the others so in this case, what we're we going to do is, I'm going to show you a picture in the future. You're going to see this quite clear. We took the pH of the poop, put it nine, make the, our agitation. When the polymers start to, to form, I just wait there and wait for the flux. And after five minutes, we just change the pH, change the pH back to three and see what's going to happen. And of course, we're going to stop the process. We're just going to cut the process right there because why the process in the beginning was in ph9 and then we start in ph3 okay so something is going to change and what's going to change is exactly this okay so as you can see on your left hand side and you on your right hand side they quite look similar okay they look similar because they are now at ph3 but at the beginning the left hand side was ph3 and the right hand side was ph9 Okay, and as you can see for the cylinder in the middle, if you take a look at the pH nine, pH nine is the better one. Okay, from this three, from this two pH, pH nine is better. Okay, but how about I start the pH, the process, sorry, at pH nine and then switch to pH three? 
So you're just going to do something like you're going to freeze your material at certain pH, and you can't just convert pH from one side to the other without taking into consideration what's going to happen with your material. Okay, and that's what this picture is showing you. And that's not the only test that we can perform on our lab. Okay, we can perform at least three or four different tests on lab scale in order to increase our knowledge about the process, about the ores, and even about the tailings, and then we can move forward. And one quite important test that we can perform it, it's called Inhoff Settling Test. Just a second, someone just arrived. And in this test, I'm just going to use a, not a cylinder, but a cone like this one that I'm showing you guys. So as much as my material moves down, okay, or downward, what you're gonna see is the cone keep getting smaller, 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 and smaller, okay? And in the end, I'm gonna see the formation of the zones, all the same, all the dynamics is going to be correlated with the graduated cylinder. So in this case, you can just use one or the other. The, the, why should I use the first method or the second method or so on? This second method, it's quite interesting if you take a look at it, because since we have this, the diameter of the cone being reduced, you can see things happening differently inside of the in hall cone that what I'm going to see in a graduated cylinder. So some author is going to show you that that's the best test that you can do, that all of your problems are going to be solved by just this test. But actually, what the experience tells us is not the case. Definitely, that's not the case. But nevertheless, you can do this. Guys, so far, until now, up to here, everything OK? Do you have any questions? No? It's OK. okay so, so let's continue. So this is a flow scheme that more simplifies flow scheme out of all that I can show you. So I have something like influence go into my equipment. But what kind of influence? Tailings, you can imagine whatever you like, OK? There are many pictures in this presentation that came from water treatment. So that's why from time to time you can see a, a name, but that's not the name that we should be using, probably because we drank from a different pot. And in this case, we, we took inspiration on different areas also, OK? So I have just one flow in, in this case, and I have two flows out, OK? So all of my water is going to be split between underflow and overflow. In this case, the underflow is the most valuable material that I have. Underflow, it's quite important for us. Okay, and that's why we're calling as affluent the overflow. But we're gonna come back to this also, okay? So thinking about thickening, that's the standard thickener. What we're gonna see in almost all thickeners is we have one zone that I'm going to represent by this. And this zone tends, tends to be a little bit more, little bit more, uh, level movement so i don't want to have a, a high shear stress or a high movement of the particles because if i do this everything that's supposed to settle start to go back into the bulk solution okay and then we have this interface interface layer and as you can see over here this would be making a correlation with that other drawing this would be zone b zone c and this one is zone d Okay, and we have this metallic arm inside of it, and this metallic arm, it's turning around, and by doing this, we're dragging the material that is already settled into the middle of the equipment, and once this material reached the middle of my equipment, it's going to also reach the underflow, and they're going to leave from this area over here. So it's just going to bypass, okay? And I have some videos to show you guys. And in due time, I'm going to show you a lot of videos today, some quite good videos. But this one is a GIF. And you can see over here that we have the polymer injection. Then we have the slurry injection. And in here, we have some automation also installed in my mineral processing plant. And that's quite important to have this. OK. But what you can see in here is my poop is being fed directly into the, the thickener, okay? 
at some point i'm going to take this red box out of the process which red box i'm going to show you in a minute but the red box would be the the feeding well okay it is feed well it's represented in here just by these two lines in here and in here and what actually happens in the thickener or in the in equipments like this is i can't make this feed just like this okay i had to put my material in a regime more turbulent in order to allow everything to happen according to the plan okay so this is going to be shown in the, in, a, in the next feature but as you can see over here we have water overflowing all the time from one side to the other and this guy over here this guy is going to collect for me the solids that is going to be settled in here okay so the material is going to settle in here it's going to be pushed around in here and then it's going to exit my plant okay so guys we have at least at least four different types of thickeners and they are all used in mineral processing activities so i'm going to try to show you a little bit of every one of these thickeners and this picture is just showing that we have this sort of thickener over here and it's quite a vertical thickener and we're going to come back to the names of this thickener in a minute but if it come back you can see it right here okay and this name deep con it's just applied to one kind of equipment so deep con is trademark of fl smith okay so if you say oh, are you using a deep con you just use one sort of equipment okay but we have different equipments not only all manufactured by of course fl smith okay and that's why i'm not going to say deep con to this guy and we can have this other horizontal thickness okay so we can have something like this names and now we're going to talk a little bit about every kind of thickness that we have and then we move forward a little bit what's going to happen with this conventional thickness is you're going to see that the difference between the thickness are actually for the, the other ones for the the first one what are we going to see is we're going to have a cylinder and attached to this cylinder we're going to have a cone and the difference are going to be in the cone angle and the cylinder height and so on okay so the thickener the conventional thickener normally has a diameter from two up to 200 meters i know it's a lot and yes it, we're talking about big structures and we have a depth from one up to seven meters okay and it's not regular to see something like 200 meters per seven meters that's going to be too too huge even to manage okay but that's what literature has to us has to offer to us this kind of numbers I, I never saw anything like that okay like 200 meters it's too big but you can see on this picture that this is one person okay right in here oh sorry my just a second because my my oh, instead of having my pen working i have actually something like a pointer let me see if now no oh, it's com it's pointer again not sure what is happening uh, it's just stop stop at work it's quite strange it's supposed to be this yeah not working anymore so okay let's just continue so as you can see over here we have a person in here and if we consider that this person have something like i don't know 1.7 meters you can take an idea of how big this structure is okay so it's huge uh, my presentation stopped ah, now i know what is the problem yes the presentation stopped so let me just take it off and then start it again let's see if now things are going to work Okay, I know that I'm not presenting anymore. Let me try again. Okay. Sorry, I'm gonna come back. Uh, definitely there is something strange about my presentation. Now it's okay. So I was mentioned this guy in here. Now things are working again. That's good. Okay, let's get back on track. 
Okay, so one thing that we can also take a look in all kind of thickness is we have to see water coming out of it. Okay, that's the reason that we have this equipment. So we're going to see this clarify the liquid overflowing the thickener okay so let me come back a minute and probably is not quite visible but if you take a look in this area over here that's going to be a part of this ring around all of my equipment that the clarified water is going to come in out of the equipment so all thickness have this okay so all thickness have this and in this equipment it's not a conventional thickener, okay? This one, it's not a conventional one. I just put it in here so you can take a look at this liquid coming out of the equipment. So if you don't have this kind of obstacles over here, the flow would be slightly different. So we try to have this very small gaps and the water has to pass through the gap in order to keep the solids inside, okay? As much as we can. Because in the end, we're gonna have solids exiting the water by the overflow but if you try to focus more on settle all of your solids you can do this okay then you have a clarifier and i'm going to come back to this to so this difference between the thickener and the clarifier in a few minutes but just consider this we have this area over here normally it's a ring around my thickener and the water the or the clarified liquid has to go through it by overflow Okay, and another thing that is quite important in our assembly of a thickener is how I'm going to feed the material to the equipment. Okay, and I have this equipment, this piece in my equipment called it feed well. Okay, so the feed well it's actually what is a device that allowed me to introduce my feed inside of the equipment, but I have to make a dispersion of my feed. I'm just going to move one slide ahead then i can come back this is a numerical simulation of the solid solid particles inside of the feed well and get into the thickener as you can see on the top we have almost every spheres are blue or bluish a few just a few are green then we have a zone transitional zone from blue to red or something like this an orange particles and then everything becomes green okay so this color is going to be related with the radio speed of all the solids inside of the feed well the idea of having a feed well it's exactly like this i'm just gonna throw the material inside of it under pressure and i want to everything goes around it so it's quite like a similar to a hydrocyclone but in the end of the feed well i want to have a complete dispersion of the material because if I don't do something like this, what's going to happen is my material is going to start to settle right below the feed. Okay. And then I'm going to have an accumulation of material below the feed. Okay. Or the feed point. And by introducing the feed well, I can increase a lot the, 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 the results that I can get from the thickener. And another thing is I have to have some kind of turbulence in the beginning of the process in order to allow my flocculant to be more accurate okay i have to give energy to the system just like i have in flotation by giving energy to the system i'm going to assure that my solid particles are going to get in touch with the flocculant and the flocculant is going to actually do its work and then i'm just going to seize this extra energy and let everything settle and then we have the thickener working so coming back one slide you can take a look at this blue structure over there and the red tube is going to be the feeding tube and the blue structure it's my feed well okay so what i want to do inside of it i want to have energy being transferred from the poop to the particles and the particles get in touch with the flocculant and after that i want to have a complete dispersion of the material i want to have something like a pulverizing action of my feed well in order to have my material being dispersed in the whole area cross section of my thickener after that i just let everything goes down okay or as much as i can so taking a look at another part that is composing my my thickener and it's regular all the thickeners of almost all the thickeners are gonna have this is this metallic arms that you can see over here that's called rake or rake 
in English, and the rate has many, many functions. The most important function is it has to move the set of the particles or the set of bed from its position, from its settling position into the center of the equipment. And by doing this, by carrying the particles into the middle, I can actually remove the solid that has settled out inside of the thickener out of the thickener. Okay. So this guy is going to scrap my material from where it settled to the middle of the equipment. And of course, I'm, I'm going to be able eventually to have a lot of stress on those arms. That can happen. And sometimes you can end up having something going, going inside of the equipment or falling down in the equipment. And what can happen is sometimes the torque in one of these arms can be so huge that you have to have something like a counter measurement in order to preserve the equipment. So nowadays, almost all thickness came directly from the manufacturer with the system that is possible to raise up the arms of your rake if you have something that is going to block the movement of it. Okay, so this is standard now. At the beginning, you had many problems with this, and it was actually something funny. Here in Brazil, even nowadays, you can see this. When you took a look at the thickness from above, just like this picture over here, you can see something like small ducks, okay, like two ducks, and these ducks was just turning around in your in your thickener. So you come around and you could see a duck around here, and for example, another duck on the other area over here. And it was quite funny because we took students to see this, and normally they, they arrive over there, they stay, look at the ducks, and some of them, already knew what the ducks means, but not all of them. And then someone would actually ask the guys from the mine company, what are the ducks? What are they for? And people used to say things like this. Oh, we use this as a training facility. So we bring our guns in here during lunchtime or something like that, and we just shoot the ducks. And that's actually not a real thing. Nobody's going to shoot the metallic ducks. That's on the opposite. That was for you to know exactly where your rake was. Okay, so what we do in the past, what we did in the past was we just have like metallic bars coming from the rake up to the top of the setting pond of the thickener. And on the top of it, we just melted down this figure like a duck or something like that, or even like a, a round plate, just something that you could actually look at the thickener and see it and see it moving. OK, and then you could see, for example, if your rake was actually uh, intact or if you have any kind of a distortion, any kind of change in the, the velocity of the rake or even in, in the angle of the rake, because it has to be 188 degrees. OK, so we use this just to know for sure how was the health of the, our rake. OK, nowadays we don't need to do this kind of things anymore, but eventually you can end up seeing something like this. So th in this picture, you can actually take a look at every part that is composing your, your thickener. OK, so you can have some instruments, automation instruments, and that's what you're going to see over here. And those are just three ways to measure the solid level inside of your thickener. OK, so I'm not going to get into this, but just know that it is possible for you to take a look on how much solids you have inside of your thickener. OK, you can see the Hake arm right over here. So it's, that's the metallic structure that I mentioned to you before. OK, you can also have some sensor in the base of your thickener. OK, and by measuring the pressure in the base of your thickener, you can take a look on how much material you have inside of your thickener. Of course, that's possible. You can also mass measure the amount of material that is going inside of the thickener. Okay, so we have mass flows to do this. But what I want to to show you guys is this. As you can see over here, we're adding the flocculant right in the feed well. Okay, we don't do this before the feed well. Actually, I know some places that do this slightly different. And I was shocked when I came to Catalan to my first technical visit in one of the companies over here. And it was quite early in the morning. 
I think it was something like 7 a.m. We started the, this technical visit, and the guys who was actually walking with us he came to, to me and said, oh, Professor, this is something quite nice because it's almost 7.30, and we're going to add flocculant right now. It's the time of the flocculant. Do you want to see it? I said, yeah, of course. And I was impressed because instead of having a system like this, that you are actually adding flocculant all the time, they just came with a, a bucket, like 20 liters bucket, and they just throw flocculant on the thickener all of, at once, okay, all of it. So it was like 20 liters of prepared flocculant being delivered to the thickener, and then they just go away. They just go away and wait 24 hours to add more flocculant. And I was looking and said, but you can't do this. I said, no, that's okay, that's okay. And I told them, no, let's wait a moment because I think something is going to happen. And the guys were a little bit impressed because when it was like 8 a.m., like 30 minutes late, we could see some balls floating around. Okay. And the balls were made of flocculant. Okay. So you had like flocculant balls. And I mean it, like this big balls. Okay. Because the flocculant start to, to get together and they start just to have cross connections between them and you have like small balls of flocculants just flowing around so actually they were just throwing away money okay they're not using flocculant they just throw away money don't do this okay you can't use flocculant like this so if you don't want to add your flocculant directly on the feed well you can actually do this slightly before the feed well and into the tubes that's also something that you can do you can add the flocculant with if with your pulp in the tubes and then after that you let the feed well do its magic and then from the feed well the material goes straight to the to the thickener okay but definitely don't add flocculant like that just come and throw everything at once don't do this okay that's this is nonsense and as you can see over here we have radioactive instruments that can actually measure the density of the poop and this is quite clever because if you know the density of the poop that is going inside of your thickener and you know the density that is going to be outside of the thickener, then you can estimate how much material I'm losing to the overflow. Okay. And then I can set up the parameters and I can increase my productivity or the, I can increase the quality of my products and so on. Okay. So it's just in time. Okay. It's an online sensor. And again, it's quite good to have this information as soon as you, they are available to you, okay? So this is just another another picture from a thickener. A conventional thickener is a cross-section of it. And as you can see over here, there is this word called effluent. So all the time you're going to see something like effluent, influent, and things like that. That's because many of these pictures are coming from water treatment, okay? So we have this interface with water treatment. It's the same equipment, okay? It's the same technique. We're going to use this almost the same, the same way, okay? Why almost? Because normally when we talk about water treatment, they don't look, they don't use, sorry, they don't use a lot of polyacrylamides of there. They probably going to use more like a coagulant than a flocculant. We do prefer flocculants. Okay. Even nowadays in Brazil, they are changing this. They are trying to forbid the use of some sort of coagulant, especially aluminum coagulants, like uh, aluminum sulfates and things like that. But eventually, you can use this in Brazil nowadays, Okay, even for water treatment. And to deliver water to houses and things like that, we still put aluminum on the water. But the feed well is right here. Okay, so that metallic part that I'm telling you about, all about this, it's right over here. So I, I'd like to say to you that if you consider the chemical part of the process, definitely 100% of your success is going to come from the correct choice of your chemicals. Dosage and pH. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Just a second. My trough is start to failing today. So again, if you want to take a look at the chemical part of the process, just go to what kind of flocculant you're going to use or coagulant, the pH that you're going to choose, and the dosage. Okay, that's the most important parameters. If you're going to take a look at the hydrodynamics of the process, go straight to the feed well. Okay, the first thing that you have to take a look is the feed well. Okay.
Okay. After that, take a look at the Hague and uh, the, the, the design of the equipment. It's also important to the relation between the height, the diameter and the throughput that you want. Okay. So if you go to the wheels book or other books regarding mineral process that I showed to you at the beginning of this lecture, you're going to see that they all come with some sort of designing of thickness and you're going to see it's not that complicated okay if you have the equipment in your lab if you prepare some tests in your lab then you can go straight to the dimensioning of the the thickness and it's going to work okay definitely it's going to work so this is coming from the wheels book okay i think it's a little bit polluted i put a lot of information in just one slide but it's just one curiosity i just want to show you that on the left hand side you have a thickener and this thickness is supported by a superstructure. What is this means? Means that this, the thickener is going to be above the ground and it's going to be held by this structure that comes from this side up to this side. So is this support mechanism over here? Okay. And on the other side, I have a center column thickener. Okay. Let's just go back one slide. This is one example of a column, a center column and that's how it works okay so you can have this thickener literally on the ground okay or you can have a superstructure below it beneath it and just raising above the ground okay uh, again pros and cons as you take a look at this thickener over here you can see that if you have any kind of problem and you need to go inside of the equipment and to fix the problem it's more access to you okay you can easily go there and make a maintenance then on the first option that we had the thickener on the ground okay on the other hand if you have a failure of this structure you can eventually lose all of your material at once everything can come out of your thickener and that's not going to happen on the other case because it's confined by the soil around it or by the material around it itself okay but this kind of thickener it's not a conventional thicker anymore this is called high grade or high capacity thickener. And this term comes from the idea of adding flocculant to it. So the first thickener, we're going to consider this, it's a conventional thickener, so no chemicals, okay? And we have some places in Brazil that they still use thickness like this without any chemicals. The second one is going to be the high rate one. We're gonna add chemicals, especially polyacrylamides, flocculants, and then we're going to increase the throughput of the equipment okay and geometry could be the same yes could be the same i'm not sure if the hake is going to be the same because as you increase the throughput probably you're going to change a little bit of your motors and even the metallic arm of the hake has to change in some cases but nevertheless if you take a look at the equipment it's going to be the same okay you're not going to see some major differences and one thing that is also very nice in this picture is you can see over here that we adding water into the thickener okay and this is the magic call it hetero dilution of your material okay and i know that's quite strange but hear me that's actually quite true okay and it works very very nicely and it's something like that if you try to put your poop with a solid content of 10 percent for example you're going to have a result. Then if you dilute your poop to 5%, you can have a, a result like 30% better. Okay. And then if you dilute, dilute your poop again to 25%, then you can increase your result like 300%. And why this is happening? Because you had in the beginning a better dispersion of the particles. And then you can have a better contact between the flocculant and the particles. And then you can have the contact between particles, flocculant, and other particles. And then you can have this entrapment of particles forming the flock, and the process continues. So sometimes you add water and you recover even more water in the end of the day. Okay. And that's quite clever. And that's most important for us, especially when your thickener is going to deal with concentrate coming from the flotation. Because this picture, as you've seen over here, that's not very regular. Normally, when you take a look at the thickener and we talk about a concentrate thickener coming from flotation, you're going to see a lot of froth on the thickener. Look at it and you can see the thickener almost floating material 
on the thickness. And then you have to add water in order to break those flocks. Okay, what kind of flock? This froth flocks. Okay, you can see like froth aggregates. So you have to break the, the froth. So I know that in the previous lecture, or uh, two previous lecture, two lectures ago, sorry, I told you that we need to have froth stability. And when we say things like that, people normally get itches because they said, okay, I want froth st stability, but just for a very, very short amount of time. Because if my froth becomes really stable, how can I eventually break the froth and collect the solids? Okay, so here's the thing. I want a froth with a small lifetime, but not only about seconds, like minutes. Okay, and then we can have a very good flotation, but after that, I need to get rid of the froth. Okay, so that's why you can see eventually all around the thickener, you can see points that we're going to just rain water on top of the thickener. Okay, and this rain is going to one break this froth, this reminiscent froth, if the case. Second, perform the miracle of the hetero dilution of our poop and third sometimes you add this extra water and the flow of the water inside of equipment actually breaks the movement of the solid particle with the overflow because now i have a second force acting on the solid particles and then they can have the solid particles coming back down into the thickener and that's what i want okay so it's quite clever to do something like this i have some videos that i want to show you guys I'm not sure why this video didn't start it by itself. It should be going around, but nevertheless, let's see the video like this. Again, I'm going to let all the video links to you, as you can see down below, so you can watch the video later on and you can listen to the music and things like that. But here's the hey, rake. Here's our thickener. And as you can see over here is a ra high rate thickener. So my feed is came in under pressure, finds the feed well, okay? It's going to move around the feed well, it's gonna have this dispersion and it's going to be pulverized inside our thickener. As you saw before, outside the thickener, we can see this superstructure holding the thickener out above the ground, okay? Holding the thickener up. And the video doesn't have any any extra sound is just music, okay, just for you to know. But that's the, the place that we can actually add our chemicals. And as you can see over here, we have the solids going around and then it's going to get in touch with the flocculent and we're gonna have the flock formation. And that's the dispersion that I meant to you before, okay? That's the effect of the feed well. It's just to throw material around and then I can use almost all the area that i have in my thickener because if i don't do this i'm just going to be using just a small portion of my thickener and that doesn't make any sense okay if i build up this huge thickener i need to use as much as, uh, as it as much of it as i can okay so these guys mclanahan they produce a lot of equipment for solid liquid separation dewatering is also called solid liquid separation and they are huge in this market. So yes, go to their website and you're going to see a lot of good things over there. So this is the overflow ring that I mentioned to you. Okay. And as you can see, it's going to be all around our thickener. And nowadays we can measure the Hague torque. As I mentioned to you, it was a problem in the past, but take a look at the lift system. Okay. So again, as I mentioned to you, if I have an increase in the torque, I just raise our our hake and then after a while i just move it back downwards and then we hope that this is going to be enough to break every kind of clogs or any kind of problems that i have down below and the process can restart they are big machines and they look from the outs dump machines but they're not okay thickeners are very good for us and very, okay so let me just move forward to the next ones okay and then later on you can go back to the video and you can admire 
this feature, okay? So in here we have the high density thickness or also called paste thickness. As I mentioned to you before, that to name deep con thickener belongs to the FL Smith, okay? So we're not gonna call this deep con thickener, but it's the same design, okay? So in this case, what is gonna happen is we're gonna change the geometry of the thickener, okay? And we're gonna change a lot of the geometry of the thickener. As you can see over here, we're talking about one floor, second floor, the first, second, third floor, and we have something like four stars high, okay? So it's really high thickener. And in some cases, that's something quite good for you because you change horizontal area to vertical uh, height. So as you can see, sometimes this can fit better to your needs. And when it say paste thickener, is slightly different from the before ones. Why? Because of the solid percentage in the end. Okay. So, oh, so I think I have the same problem with my presentation again. I think it stopped work again. Yeah, it's working, but oh, now it's working. Let me just try to. I don't know what's happened today. I think it's because it's the last lecture. Okay. So let's take a look at the paste thickener again, and. First of all, as I mentioned to you, the geometry is completely different. Second thing, the solid content in the discharge, okay? When you say that you're producing paste, you're gonna have something above 70% of solid contents in the end of the process. And if you have a paste, a mineral paste, then you don't need a tailing dam. So you can pile up paste. And it's quite nice if you do this because paste are quite stable. Okay, so you're gonna increase a lot of the safety of your disposal of your tailings. Okay, so as you can see over here, they're going to give you some inputs regarding the equipment. We still have the feed well, and the idea is the same, but as you can see over here, we can add flocculant in many places, not only at the feed well, and that's also clever, okay? If you don't add your flocculant all at once, but you can actually distribute flocculant. You can actually increase also uh, the recovery of your particles. Okay, in this case, we still have a, a, hake, a rake and it's still moving, but as you can see over here, it's completely different geometry. Okay, and we push everything to the center as much as we can. We have this, poop in, this pump in the bottle to just pump the poop outside and some components are the same, okay? As you can see, they even show you the same components from the last video and so on. And actually, it's quite normal to do this, okay? Because the equipments are not completely different one to the other. But nevertheless, uh, it's a very good equipment and very good piece of machine can give you very good results in order to recover water, okay? So yes, let's move forward because I have to show you more things. And I just want to show you these two pictures because if you take a look at the Wheels test book, okay, that show, book that I showed you before, Wheels and Finch 2015, it's gonna show you that we have high density thickness and we have paste thickness. They are basically quite similar, okay? But as you can see over here, paste thickness, they are higher, okay? We have big machines and we're gonna use more the height of the equipment in order to increase the solid content, okay? I want to show you guys one last video from McLahan. And this is the ULT. And this machine, it's quite interesting because it is a paste thickener, but it's slightly different because it's a hakeless one. So you don't need to have a hake anymore. So. Take a look at the feed well, okay? They're going to show you how they do this magic because you don't have anymore that vertical axis spinning around and just pushing the material to the bottom, okay? You don't need to have the hake anymore. It's going to be cheaper for you to maintain this equipment because you don't have to pay for this extra engine, this extra motor spinning around, but you're gonna to add the flocculants over there Okay, and then we know the magic, we know the trick, the flocculant is going to get in touch with the particles, the particles are going to form flocks, the flocks is going to start to settle down, okay? And what it's going to do 
is since we have this feedback well designed, we have this dispersion of the flux, and then we're going to have a very steep angle on the conical part, okay? And that's going to be enough for all material to slide down and go into the bottle of the equipment and leave the equipment, okay? So the, the vacuum that's going to be produced by the pump itself, okay? On this moment, when I have this lorry pump, okay? Then it's going to be enough to move all material out. We're not going to have any kind of clogs, any kind of material being stuck inside of the machine, okay? It's quite nice. It's a very clever design, okay? So if you're looking for a thickener, this one is quite impressive, okay? I was very, very impressed when I saw this machine work, okay? And the, the settle bed, in some sort of thickness, normally in almost all kind of thickness, they're going to be quite uh, com com mechanical competent. Okay, if you don't have the, the rake to break this this bed, you can end up having a difficult, a very very po high probability to have your thickness clogged. Okay, so to finalize this, I'm going to come back exactly to this picture in a few slides we're going to come back to this okay so this is the end of the the video so as i mentioned to you we finish with this picture in here I, I i put together this just for you to take a look that we can have different kind of equipment like high rate high class high density and paste okay so as you can see over here the slope degree or the angle of the conic part of the conic part in the high rate, it's going to be from nine, zero to nine degrees. And when you go to the EOLT, we're going to talk about 45 up to 60. Okay, the pace 30 to 45. And just one option without rake, this would be the rake class. And as you can see over here, the bed residence time in hours. Okay, so in the high rate, it's going to be one, two hours, and the rake class from four to eight hours, and the pace thickener four to ten hours so 10 hours of resident time inside of the machine it's quite high but then again it's a continuous machine so you're putting material constantly in you always taking material out okay so that's not a problem and just to make this differentiation we have two machines with similar function one is the thickener and the other one is the clarifier so what is the difference between the thickener and the clarifier? Actually, I put in here the difference that it's on the wheels book, okay? But I'm gonna try to give you one a little bit more simpler from this one, okay? So consider this, what is your product? If your product is the liquid phase, you have a clarifier. If your product is the solid phase, then you have the thickener. Because what the thickener wants to do is to take your poop, okay? So you're going to increase the solid content. The clarifier, on the other hand, wants to clarify your water, okay? So taking this into consideration, what kind of conclusions can we draw? If I have a clarifier in my hands, I want to produce liquid, okay? So I'm gonna have very, very few solid particles in my liquid phase. On the other hand, I'm going to lose a lot of water in my underflow, okay? It has to be like this, okay? So if I want to have a lot of water, I'm going to eventually lose water. The, clar the clarifier is going to be working like this, okay? However, the thickener, my focus now is on the solid particles, uh, the solid fraction. So now I want to increase the solid content in my underflow. By doing this, I'm going to eventually lose solid particles in the overflow, okay? So if we're working on a water treatment plant, it's going to be quite regular if you have a clarifier and you want 0% solids on your liquid phase, okay? Normal. And then you're going to have something like 5 or 10% solid content on your underflow. But if you go to a thickener, you're going to have something like one up to 3% of solids in your overflow. 
but you want your overflow as thick as possible. Okay, so just consider this. What is your product? If your product is water, then you have a clarifier. If your product is the solids, then you have a thickener. Okay, it's quite simple. So let's move forward and let's see some different kinds of thickener. That's the lamella thickener. And what is the difference? First of all, the geometry is quite different. And then we have plates inside of the equipment. And I'm going to make sure that my water is going to flow through these plates and by doing this okay the solid is going to start to move down because i'm going to be removing energy from this water moving upward and by doing this the gravity is going to do the trick and is going to pull down the solid fraction okay so these plates are inclined something like five, 55 percent the sorry 55 degrees and again, the name lamella thickener comes from where? I want to have a lamella flow of my liquid phase through the plates, okay? And then I hope that the flux are going to start to settle down and then move downward into this conic chamber that I have below my thickener. And then from there, I can remove my solid fractions. Okay, I have a video from a technical visit that I made in Albania a few years ago, and they have a lamella thickener operating there. So take a look at this video. You're gonna see a filter press and a lamella thickener working over there. You can see how big this machine is and how great this machine actually is, okay? So this is a, a picture and it, it's not mine, but it was took from the top of a lamella thickener. And as you can see, from this part over here, we have this inclination over here, and that's going to indicate to us that we have these parallel plates below inside the equipment, but below this level, okay? So if I take a look inside of it, right to the plates, that's what I'm going to see, okay? In this case, we have this 60 degrees angle. Before I showed to you 55, so 55 it's coming from the wheels book, and this 60 degrees is coming from this company match can okay so you can see that we can have some slightly different from one machine to the another it's normal it's regular so again the water has to go up and through these plates and then the solid can't keep on pay, the same pace with the water because of the gravity and then the particles start to go into the direction of the plate because it's settling and then it the particles use this inclined plane just to move downward and that's the trick of the lamella thickener okay and works okay for many materials for many minerals okay so why not to try it that's the last thickener that i want to introduce to you and then i want to show you that we can also use the centrifugal forces in order to remove water so the hydrocyclone the same hydrocyclone that i have mentioned to you before first for classification then to make this concentration i also mentioned to you the sliming that i can use hydrocyclone too now i'm back to the hydrocyclone and i can use again centrifugal separation in order to recover water okay and this picture it was took by the people from mclahan again okay it's available on their website and they are showing you the, the hydrocyclone not as the only machine to remove water, okay? But we can actually have this. And I actually showed you, this, showed you guys this picture before when we have the hydrocyclone installed right on the tailing dance. So we take all of our tailings, pass through this hydrocyclone, and we can even recover a little bit more water. And the material that is going to go to the underflow, I just dump in the tailing dance, but I can collect all the overflow because the water normally goes to the overflow and then bring back to some other equipment or to the mineral processing plant. In this case, we are using the hydrocyclone just before one of other equipment for solid liquid separation. It's quite normal to have this assembled for the high frequency screening or the water screening. Okay, I'm gonna come back to this later on today. We're going, I'm gonna show you guys uh, the water screening, and then you're gonna see hydrocyclones installed 
almost on the top of the screen. Okay, it's quite interesting to see this. So we have another video in here from McLaren, and there is going to show you hydrocyclones. And as you can see over here, they're showing you that can be used for the sliming, the watering, and so on. But look how much water our hydrocyclone is still putting out of it. But if I change the geometry and the parameters, then I can change this. I can produce material with less water, OK? So as you're going to see in the, the few seconds in this same video, we can use the hydrocyclone just as the first equipment or one of the first equipment to remove a little bit of the water and then to feed another machine and then another machine. And then we can have our solid liquid separation, OK? So another equipment that we can use, and this opens a new chapter for us, is the continuous solid bowl centrifuge. Okay, And by looking at this equipment, looks like something like a magnetic separator or something like this. But trust me, there's nothing compared one to the other. Let me just show you this, and maybe it's going to be more easy for you to understand. So what are we going to have is I'm going to feed my material from one side and you can see the side right over here. OK, so in here we're going to feed our pulp and we're going to have two rotating chambers inside of the equipment. And this is going to do what? The same thing that happens inside our wash machine. We're going to turn this drum around and we're going to do this so fast that all materials are going to be thrown to the outer part. OK, but then we have something like in this case, OK, uh, a pipe, OK, uh, a bowl inside of the equipment. And we're going to retain the solids inside of this bowl and looks eventually like a spiral inside of the equipment. But the, so the solids are going to be retained, but the water is going to flow out of the equipment. If I show you guys this animation, I think it's going to be slightly more easy to understand. But as you can see over here, we're going to use like a screw. OK, and this screw is going to compress the solid out of the equipment. But as you can see around the equipment, I have points that I'm going to be able to collect the water. So our, our water is going to flow out. OK, and the solid is going to flow through the equipment and then outside the equipment. I have also a video from this equipment working, OK, from another company, from this company. I think it's a Chinese company. I think it is a Chinese company, OK? And let's see the machine working. And I think it's going to be easier for us to understand it. Since we're talking about centrifuge and centrifuge forces, the machine is going to be all closed and has to be closed to avoid any kind of problems. But you can see right here that cylinder that I mentioned to you that's going to be spinning around inside of the equipment. So the idea, the conception behind this is just like this. I have liquid. I have what they call it heavy liquid and solid. And what they're going to do is since everything is spinning around inside of the equipment, I'm going to have this separation of the material bind this rotation okay and this this is what gonna happen okay that's why you have like three faces because they have this two different kind of liquids we normally don't have this in mineral processing but nevertheless you can have solids going to one side okay and you can have in this machine according to the manufacturer uh, these fluids this two kind of fluids is heavy liquid and this other liquid coming out in another area, in another sector of the same machine. OK, so as you can see over there, we have this design that allowed us to transport the solids through the equipment, but the liquid is going to come out on the overflow of the machine. And that's the beautiful, though, the beauty of this equipment. And so in this case, according to manufacturer, you can also have something like a brine coming on one hand or pure water on the other bowl, and then your solids on the other floor, OK? It's very good if you want to remove sand, because in order to treat this water, we can also do this. This machine 
is a different, also a different set of machines, a different type of machine. This is the watery screen, okay? And I mentioned to you hydrocyclones, right? So here it is. So you can see the hydrocyclone over here. This is the motors that are going to give us the vibration that we need. So we will have the slurry coming in this area of the machine and then going through the machine. And as you can see over here, we have the material coming out of the screen almost completely dry, okay? And the impact that we can have when we saw this, it's quite impressive, okay? So how the dewatering screen works, okay? You can have the slurry come on one side, on one side. in my case, right here is my right-hand side. And then you have this pond, the settling pond, okay? So that's represented by the number two over here. And as you can see by this blue area over here, we can have a lot of water, but the solid is going to flow down, it's going to settle. And the vibration of the machine is going to push our solid up to the, the screen. So different from the, the previous screen or screening machine that I mentioned to you, that I showed you before, in this case, we have an inclination that's going to be bad for business because it's going to retain my material more time inside of my equipment, but that's exactly what I want to do, okay? So I want to have this extra difficult being transferred to the solids and the solids has to go up the hill and then leave the machine. By doing this, I can increase very good results. I can increase, sorry, my solid content and I can achieve very good results. And that's what I'm going to see coming out of the equipment. And guys, I could see video coming out of the equipment with something like 70 up to 80% solid content. It's really, really good, okay? And then you just take this material and pile. And you put like a stock pile or a pile, and you don't need, you definitely don't need tailing dams for this. Okay. And countries around the world, they are actually the main uh, non tailing dams policy. Okay. So if that's the case, if that's going to happen in your country, just start to taking a look right now at those kind of equipments. Okay. Thickness can't do this unless if you're talking about the paste thickener. And as you can see in this picture, again, this picture is really beautiful. And look, the amount of water that I have in here, and a few centimeters later on, the water just disappear, okay? Because the water passed through the screen. And we have another video and take a look at how beautiful is the sand coming out of this dewatering screen, okay? So it's really impressive on how much water you can actually take back. And as I mentioned to you, if you add more water, you can recover more water. So you can have even extra water. And as you see over here, just 7%, not more solid content, but 7% moisture content in the final product. It's really good. It's really, really good, okay? Uh, places that we want things like this, for example, if I'm working with cement production, I have to remove as much water as I can from my, my raw products, okay? And this kind of screen, it's amazing to do this, okay? But if I'm producing sand, okay, and I'm talking about, for example, riverbed sand, I have to take the water out, okay? This kind of vibratory screen are perfect for this, okay? And they're quite cheap to have around us. So let's talk about filtering and filtration, okay? So when we talk about filtration, we instantly think about coffee, okay? And that's right, okay? What kind of filtering that we're going to perform, it's related with coffee filtering, okay? We can have this correlation. But when we do filtration in mineral processing, we actually want to produce cake. And I know it sounds strange if you consider we're going to produce cake in a mineral processing facility. Okay, so if you have filtering and we talk about coffee and if you have cake, we think about some good dessert, then we can have a very good evening or good afternoon. Yeah, but that's not the case at all. The kind of cake that we want to produce is this one. Okay, so it's solid cake. So that's the name that we have when we talk about filtering. And this one 
is a filter press, a horizontal filter press. So the material goes into the filter press as a slurry, and then we're going to have a filtrate that's going to be the liquid phase, and we're going to have the cake that is going to be the solid phase. And again, I have videos, as I mentioned to you before, in my channel about this visit in Albania, and you can see a filter press working quite nice to see chromite concentrate being dewatered in a machine just like this. Okay, so this is the filter press. I'm not going to give you a lot of information about the how the machine works and things like that. But what we have is we have this these frames and around the frame we're going to put this filter media or filter cloth and then we just assemble all the frames we pump the slurry inside and then we compress the frames with the slurry inside of it and after that we're going just to cut the feed of the machine i have to stop the feed of this machine and then i start disassemble the frames and then the cakes start just to coming out of the machine okay so let's take a look at this video and we're going to understand a little bit better about this overhead beam filter press why overhead beam because as you can see the support of the filter press is on the top of it okay and this is quite clever from these guys because normally when we have this beam below the machine and actually we have a lot of machines that goes through this concept the water and also the solid the cake always uh, felt on top of my beam okay and eventually by abrasion and corrosion you start to lose the beam okay and that's not going to happen here so let's go to see how this works this slurry is going to be pumped into our filter press i know it's quite slow video it should be moving a little bit faster but nevertheless let's see it so in this case we can actually add slurry on both sides of the machine okay that's not regular you don't have this in all kinds of filter press but in this moment all the the frames are going to be filled with uh, our slurry and as you can see after you have half of it completely filled then we start to field on the height okay and then what we're going to see is we're going to apply pressure and by doing this liquid start to pulling out of the plates and actually that's something real we're going to see something like this happening and after you pump your material and you already had liquid out you start the compression okay so you can also add more water into the, the frames and this water is going to do what it's going to wash all of the materials from the tubes into the, the, the filter press and it's going to also hetero dilute the material inside of the, the frames okay again always remember this see if i put water in eventually i can have more material out okay and i know it's strange but i can recover more water by adding water to the system and that's actually work so after this compression i just disassemble the frames and the cakes just fell down okay and actually that's exactly what we're going to see well why people hate just hate this kind of filter because for many years all this operation was manual so you have to go there by yourself open a valve wait until all the frames were full close the valve apply pressure remove pressure and then you have to remove the cake all by yourself if you take a look at the video from the technical visit in albania you're going to see that they had two collaborators just to discharge the filter press okay and takes a long time to do this definitely takes a long time to do this and in this case you can see right now we're moving into automation so we can remove the operator from the process and then you can start to speed things up a little bit i have to make a confession i never saw an horizontal filter press working in my life okay i saw a lot of filters during my time but i never saw this guy work i'm very curious to see this in operation the real machine in operation not only videos 
but the concept is the same from the, the before okay but the difference is instead of having the machines with vertical frames now i have the machine with horizontal frames and looks like the same or the same concept but actually it's not as you can see over here we apply the pressure from the top to the bottom okay and again the the working principle is the same but how about the cake how can i remove the cake i have to remove the cake by the side of the machine so i have like to push aside the cake and i think that's going to be a nightmare i really don't think that's a good machine to work with okay maybe i'm wrong okay and i get maybe i'm really wrong but i would like to see this machine operating because every time that i saw a video or something like produced by manufacturers like this it made a lot of promise and it's only promise okay but again i really want to see this in action and i never had this chance okay probably because they're not so often around us okay but also probably because they are not very effective okay i have to tell you this the manufacturer they always always try to sell us and they gonna say that this is the best machine ever invented that it's going to work marvelously i never saw it so that's the cake and how are you going to take this cake out for me it's it's still a mystery well actually i know how the cake is going to be removed i just don't know how effective this is going to be on a daily basis okay but we have to wait and see but as you can see we have the plates we have the cloth we have the same dynamic of applying pressure anyway it's the same machine on a different position okay but talking about different machine here it is the vacuum filters okay so i just showed you a filter that i have to apply pressure in order to remove the liquid in here we're going to do this slightly different i'm going to suck the water out of it and we have at least two different machines that we can widely use or widely see in our mineral processing plants the first one is the drum so let me just move a little bit forward this is the drum okay then i come back i think you already have a better conception about what is this drum and let's see this cross section that we have on our right hand side what we have is the drum is part submerged into our material it could be our concentrate could be our tailings doesn't matter but the drum is going to touch the water okay and the water level the liquid level and on that moment i have the vacuum on its maximum and as you can see over here over here we have suction happening in this area so the liquid is going to go through the filter and into this central duct and you can see the central duct in this part of my figure and for there out of the equipment okay so you're sucking the water out of the equipment but after we left this level okay we don't have poop anymore but we keep doing suction why because we're forming the cake we're still removing water there's still water on the cake but we're making the cake even more compact and by doing this more mechanically competent but then again we're going to be producing a lot of keplers we're going to have all about capillarity right now and then if i add water i can remove more water why because this water flow is going to do this is going to move through the keplers and when we have this water moving it's going to also drag fine particles with it and that's one thing that's going to happen and by moving there by rearranging the fine particles i'm going to be increasing the density of my cake on top of that the water moving it's going to find like small droplets of water in the these cavities in the into these capillars and water get in touch with water they're going to connect and they move together okay so i eventually remove this water from the scapulars formed before so that's why we still have suction in this area over here okay and then we have 
a knife installed over here just to cut the material out of my drum. So if I cut off the washing water, I'm gonna have a worse cake than I had before if I just do this. So I'm gonna take my filtrate and I'm going to recirculate the filtrate as washing water. Okay? It's quite clever. So I produce, for example, 10 liters per minute and I'm gonna recirculate it something like one liter. So again, if I recirculate this one liter, I end up producing the same 10 liters but then I'm going to see an increase, for example, to 11 liters of water. So keep that in mind. You have to recirculate water. It's a have to, okay? So it's compulsory. I have to do this. It's a major thing. So this is a, a, the drum, okay? And you can see the knife right over here. So this is the knife. And the knife is just cutting out our cake from the, tr the drum surface. And we have another video. And this video, it's actually quite nice you can see a lot of information but again it's from the manufacturer so you're going to see some extra data so this is the pond as i mentioned to you our settling point our drum is going to be going around this and then we have the pulp being filtered through it and how one thing that i have to mention is all around my drum i have to have the filter cloth okay so i have to came around the drum and pass this filter cloth all over it, okay, all on it. So we have to have this cloth literally uh, closing everything around the drum. Otherwise, it's not going to work, okay? So let's take a look at this and see how it's going to work. See the rotation, it's quite slow rotation. And let's wait for them to make the advertise and then you can see the, this filter working. Okay, here is interesting. They have different modes to discharge your cake. And this is quite important because depending on the cake that you're producing, the knife is not going to be the best. Oh, this is also nice, as you can see over there. I'm coming back to that. Let me pause the video one moment. So you just saw something that moving. That's the agitator. I have to have an agitation of the poop inside of the machine. Otherwise, the soil is going to start to settle. Then my filter is not going to. So I have to have this equipment inside of my machine to keep everything dispersed inside of the machine okay so that's quite nice and i know that the knife is not the best solution because eventually the knife can even cut off holes in my cloth in my filter cloth i don't want this to happen okay so take a look at the at the cake it's very nice this kind of videos and how good this is the cloth how good the machine actually operates this is the filter that and as you can see, you can form this uniform cake, then we wash the cake, then we just scrap the cake out of it. So that's the filtration area I already mentioned to you. That's the washing ramp, okay, or washing area. Then we have the drying of the cake, then we have the discharge of the cake. So that's the cycle of our filter. Okay. So again, the name of this machine, vacuum filter okay in this case vacuum drum filter okay that's quite nice and let's move forward because after this we only have uh, advertiser for the manufacturer guys what is the problem of the drum we use a lot of space and very small area from the drum it's actually working okay so if i just pause the video and take a look at how much area of the drum is actually working is just a very small area so the guys have this idea so instead of having a huge drum why not put many discs in the same area that i have occupied before for the drum and it was actually cl very clever okay so what we're going to do now is instead of having that cylinder we have a disc and the cloth media is in the disc as the same way Okay, oh, the stage that I had on the drum, you're gonna have the same stage in the disc 
as the as just as I had before. Okay, but then again, if I take a look at just one disk, definitely the drum is going to produce more than the disk. But actually, I can put a lot of disks in the same area that I used to occupy by the drum. And by doing this, I increase the throughput. Okay, and that's the beauty of it. Okay, so let's take a look at this. We have this animation on our right hand side, and then we have on the other hand uh, a very beautiful picture about the disk and how the disk is going to work. But as you can see, the disk is going to dive into the, the poop, and then we have the suction zone. And as you can see over here, by this greenish area becoming a more blue, dark blue area, that's the cake being formed. And the discharge in this case, we don't need a knife, okay? We just blow air from inside of the disk to the outside of the disk. So in certain points, which means zone one, two, and three, what we're going to have is we're going to be sucking our, our water inside to the disk, okay? Or, which means through the disk. And on the zone four, I'm going to be blowing air outside from inside to the outside of the disk and by doing this the cake collapse and detach from the disk it's quite sweet idea okay so we have another video to see how this machine work i make sure to collect many videos for you guys this is our vacuum disk filter and as you can see over here, we have many disks, okay? And again, the beauty of this machine is to have many disks. And also the expenditure of uh, energy in this kind of machine, it's almost identical to the drum, okay? So I'm going to change the drum to the disk. I'm going to be using the same energy. Definitely, I'm going to use more cloth on the disk, but I'm going to produce more. So I have a high throughput. And we have disks of many sizes as the manufacturer I show you in this case, like extra large disks and things like that. But this is just advertised. Let's just wait a second and we can see the disks in operation. So here it is. We have now the feeding of the of our settling point. We don't need an agitator. The disc can do the agitation by itself. Okay. And as you can see over here, the disc is turning around, and by doing this, it's going to suck water out of the of the poop. And literally, the solid is going to be attaching to the disc surface and going to form the cake. Then we're going to wash the cake, and then we're going to dismantle the cake. Okay, and that's the cake coming out of the disc. So we just blow air of the cake through the cake, sorry, from the inner part of the disc to the outer side part of the disc, and the cake just collapse, it collapse, and goes to this transport area of the equipment and just move outside of the equipment. So it's really impressive. The disc, it's really good. But just consider this, in these two machines, the drum and the disc, we need a filtering media or filter cloth. Okay, we have to use this cloth. So it's just like make cheese. Okay, we need this cloth in order to allow the liquid to go through, but to retrain the solids. Okay, the last part of the video is not important to us. But then some guys had this brilliant idea. How about we perform a same procedure use the disc the same way but how about we have a disc without cloth we don't want to use this cloth anymore because we have to change this cloth periodically because it's going to wear and then they have idea to use a ceramic disc and it's actually something amazing because you're going to change from that frame the steel frame structure with the cloth around it to this ceramic structure and in here, it's all about capillarity because the ceramic has a lot of micropores on it. So the water can go through the micropore 
and leave the equipment, okay? But the solids can't do this. And then we're gonna have the solids retain where? On the ceramic plates. So what is the difference between the first disc that I mentioned to you, that I showed you, to this one? We're gonna call this ceramic vacuum filter or disc vacuum filter. The disc, we use cloth. In the ceramic, we don't have cloth. We don't need cloth, okay? And it actually works a lot. And I was last week on a webinar proposed by Metsu. It was hosted by Metsu. And they have this equipment on sale. And they are telling us that these segments, these parts of the disc, the ceramic disc, they can be working with for almost two years. It's really good. The lifetime is two years. It's quite impressive, OK? And we have even other things that looks like sci-fi fiction, but it's not scientific fiction. But we can actually put all of our equipment, our vacuum equipment, inside of a hyperbaric chamber. Okay. So instead of making my filtration in one ATM, in one atmosphere, we can increase the pressure, for example, up to four bars and do the same thing. Okay. But by doing this, by applying pressure from the outside, okay, we can definitely remove more water because the water is going to be forced from the outside to the inside part of the discs or to the, of the drum. And then we can have this hyperbaric equipment. Okay. I never saw anyone working. Okay. And I'm really scared to see one like this because I'm very worried about hyperbaric chambers. But nevertheless, you can eventually find something like this in your endeavors, in your mineral endeavors. And I have another video to show you guys, the same manufacturer, Andritz, and, or Andritz. And here is the hyperbaric filter. Okay. And one thing that I know for sure, the results are quite good. The results are definitely good. But you have a pressure of vase, okay? If this thing just collapse or have a micro rupture or something like that, definitely going to have an accident. So as you can see, we're talking about the same system, the same disk vacuum filters, but they are going to be installed inside of a hyperbaric chamber. Okay. And the result, the results could be better. Definitely the results are going to be better. Okay. But nevertheless, that's one other possibility. So since we have extra pressure from the outside, from the outer part, then we're going to have a high grade in the, in the filtration. Okay. So as you can see in this blue area is the same that I showed to you before, but this is new. In here, you can see how the water flows through the, the disc and inside the disc in order to meet the central pump, central, sorry, tube. And from the central tube, it's going to move outside the equipment. It's quite nice. And in this case, again, we don't have a knife. We don't need a knife. We just blow air from inside to the outer side. And this is the cake produced by the equipment. Okay. Again, it's a very good idea. I know that Bokela and other manufacturers, they have this kind of equipment on sale right now, but I never saw one, be, one working, one operating in mineral processing plants. I'm not sure if this is actually uh, something that we're going to see in the future or not. But nevertheless, according to the manufacturer, they can reduce up to the 50% total cost operation, high throughput, clear filtrate. Yeah. And it's going to work even to fine particles. So if they can deliver this, that's actually quite nice. Another filter that we have is the belt filter. So in the case that you don't want to have a cake mixture uh, with a mixture so the moisture is so content so low, so it's not critical for you to have this cake moisture too low, you can definitely go to this kind of system and you can eventually have a water recovery quite fast. And how this equipment works, you have a belt. And this belt is actually a filtering, a filtering media or a filtering cloth 
and the water can go through this belt. And you can see over here that we have this duct over here. So the water is going to flow through the belt. And by this vacuum manifold over there, we have the water flowing through it. Okay, so let me show you also a video from FL Smith. And I think it's going to be more clear to you how this horizontal or belt vacuum filter works. Okay. Internet is amazing, right? I have only the way to see this equipment in advance and through some very scarce pictures all the model, every part, everything. It's amazing. So here is the basic. Okay, you have the filter cake, you have the filter media, and you have this drainage grid. You don't have vacuum on the whole belt. Vacuum applied to some specific below your belt. But the belt is itself it's composed by a filtering media or a filtering cloth. And it's quite a clever idea. It's quite interesting. And it actually works. You just apply vacuum and you can remove water. That's the drainage belt. And as we mentioned before, we have around the drainage belt, we have the cloth wash the material on the top of it. That's the filter cloth, as you can see over there. And then we just need to add our material and start the process. It's quite simple. As you can see over here, we feed the material direct. And as the belt starts to move, it to drain water instantly. And the results are quite good. So. This uh, first machine over there, we just need to correct the height of our, or our cake, and then we add more water to the cake, and then we could remove this water further on, okay? So in here, you can remove the cake, remove the filter cloth, take a look at the belt, okay? Removing the belt, we can see the rollers below it, and if we remove also this, we can see over there, the pipes that are going to remove the liquid phase out of the machine. Okay, so that's the the drainage that I was talking to you about it. Also, very very clever machine. Yeah, and definitely it's safer to work with a machine like this than to work with the hyperbaric chambers and things like that. So, yeah. So this is the washing water. Okay. So we just pour this water through the belt and then we can have good. Then on the turning point of the belt, we can also blow some air if that's the case but normally the knife is more than enough and here's the trick i'm gonna have material contaminating in, in pregnant in my belt so i have to wash it down and i'm gonna do this on the lower part so i am able to not only wash my cloth media but also my belt i wash both together okay so from information for the manufacturer it's okay so into the last machine that i want to show you is the drying machines okay and normally we don't like to dry our our oars or especially our tail but some applications we have to dry our concentrates we're going to lose energy because we have to transfer turn to our to our poop uh, material in order to remove the moisture that we have over there. So, of course, we're gonna a lot of water. So we're gonna have, like for example, stage in a thickener or a paste thickener or something like that. We can even use a hydrocyclone. Then we can go to a vibratory screen or 
uh, high frequency screening. And after that, we can even have some kind of vacuum filtering. Normally, that's not the case. Normally, if you or the vibratory the vacuum filtering is just one of the two, not common to use both. But nevertheless, after this, here, okay. So when the material arrives to us, patient, then we're going to talk about the moisture. Probably has less than 10% of moisture. But nevertheless, this is one of the options that we have, and this is called the the rotating drum. Okay, so we can have this equipment and it's the regular drum and we're going to have what we're going to have gas being pumped in counter current with the material so the gas enter on the right hand side with high temperature there is going to pass through the machine it's going to change heat with our material and it's going to leave on the other point on the other side of the machine with less temperature and also a lot of water content on the gas. It's going to have this exchange of water and also temperature. And the drum is going to turn relatively slow, like 25 revolutions per minute. And has to be like this, because if I don't roll our material, the, the particles are not going to dry. And another thing that can happen is if you take this material and put this on a, uh, the drying oven, for example, probably when the material comes out of the drying oven, it's going to be like blocks of the material, chunks of the material, because we're going to have agglomeration because of the temperature. So if you don't want to have this agglomeration, definitely you have to go to a, a rotating drum like this. And definitely you're going to lose a lot of material because we're talking about fine particles and these particles are going to lose water and we turn in around this particle, probably going to have a lot of dust and you got, you're going to have to manage this dust. Okay, You're going to have to be extra careful with this dust. So our last video for now, all of our lectures, is about this rotatory dryer. And let's see how this works. So you have this heat chamber, and we just let the heat go through the machine. And we have this spiral around the machine. And the spiral are there just to move the material inside. And it's like similar to the mills. I have to this need to take the material out of the bottom part of the material, the machine, go up through the top of the machine and this fall down. Okay. And if you have a huge dispersion of the machine inside of the equipment, better is going to be your dry. Okay. And you're going to save a lot of energy by doing this. So guys, with this, we close all of our lectures. I would like to apologize if I made myself not so clear as I should, if my English was not so good as desired. And I hope, I really hope that with this, you could understand a little bit better mineral processing and why it's so challenging for us here in Brazil and in the whole world. Okay, so we have many obstacles and many challenge ahead of us and as i mentioned to you fine particles low grade material water and so on and we definitely could need all the help that we can get so you all most invited to join us in mineral processing and why not make this world a little bit better by supplying better materials okay so thank you very much for watching us i hope that you like this